Well, thank you uh, for uh, coming here for our uh, press conference right before the, the spring break. We're really pleased to be able to get uh, educational savings accounts you know, through the Senate onto the House. Uh, it's one of our top priorities as well as uh, IP reform. Uh, they wouldn't be where they're at if it wasn't for the pressure that, that our group has put on and, and continue to, to really you know, put the pressure onto the leadership. You know, one thing I will say, you know, we're waiting with bated breath to get our parking spots back uh, because, you know, Democrats did not filibuster policy yesterday as opposed to uh, what we were removed from. So we're waiting to, to hopefully do that, that parking spot swap, uh, you know, that we were removed from. I say that in jest, but uh, we're, we're looking forward to continue to, to press the envelope. You know, it's not done uh, in terms of illegal immigration, the number one issue. That has tentacles that spread everywhere into the state. Sex trafficking, the, the overdose problem, fentanyl, you name it, jobs. Uh, we're looking to, to take that fight in, in this next go round. Uh, looking at the budget, that's one thing that is, is extremely vital. We as a group are going to be doing a, a fine tooth comb approach of, of going through our budget, you know, trying to eliminate the waste and abuse uh, of our budget process. Um, you know, what we had uh, with the, the ESA, where we had a lot of things that we were extremely proud to, to be able to get through with the, the capability of parents to have that choice to send their child where they uh, want to go with the dollars that they're sending uh, into the government. Uh, but there are others that, that I think that we, we could have done better on. Uh, but that's the process. We understand that. Uh, I know we're going to be coming back with the, the fight with, uh, you know, child care. Uh, you know, it's funny to hear the, the Democrats speak out of both sides of their mouth. We, we hear that uh, Democrats saying that, that no money should go to any uh, institution that has any faith base whatsoever, but yet want to, to infringe on, on ch child care and say that uh, no state dollars should be going to that. Well, will that translate into uh, all the way from, from cradle to, to grave in any dollar spent uh, that, you know, now government's going to, to be controlling that aspect? Uh, so there are a myriad of, of things that we're going to be dealing with that we're going to have to fight on. Uh, I know it seems like in the Senate it's nothing but a, a, an extravaganza of tax credits, and that's one thing we've got to really push back upon so we can give broad-based tax relief and income, and especially personal property tax. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a, another huge uh, issue we're going to be taking on and, and really pressing in on. Uh, so we're looking forward to this next half of session uh, and really going to be digging in our heels on these big issues that people have sent us here uh, to do. Again, our caucuses were really cut and clear of what they want us to do, and it is to be bold and to really push in on these issues that matter most to them. So I know uh, Senator Ivo wanted to talk about the budget, yep. uh, so go ahead. Uh, so, you know, really in, in light of the context of the fiscal note on the, on the legislation we passed today, I think the conversation about the budget is going to be even more important. I want to stress Governor Mike Parson has not recommended a balanced budget. Uh, he, rec he has recommended a budget that would is expected to have the state take in $13 billion, and he wants to spend $15 billion of general revenue funds. That is not a balanced budget. I don't think the state of Missouri is looking for that. And Emily, I apologize. What, what, did, Senator, what did Senator Huff say about uh, if we don't get the FRA done? Stripping $4 billion out, possibly. Oh, wow. I don't, I don't know if I've ever been threatened with a good time like that before, because I think we're looking for uh, a lot of cuts. You know, even if we took $4 billion out of this budget, uh, we wouldn't even be back to 2020 levels of spending. So uh, there's a real disconnect between uh, the fiscal conservative promises that a lot of Republicans are making in campaign season and what they're continuing to talk about when we come down to the, the Senate floor and actually debate policy. So I'll tell you what, the, the, the budget that the governor had is a mess. Uh, it's going to take a lot of work. We're getting initial indications from the House uh, that they've, they've, they're going to demonstrate a, a bit more fiscal constraint. I'm looking forward to seeing that. But I can tell you, it's hard to imagine this place uh, you know, passing a budget that isn't balanced. And we're going to be really focused on that. So. In lieu of Senator Bratton's opening statement, so is there, and speak for any of you, is there any path forward on tax credits on child care? What would that look like? You know, I, I think that what we're focusing on is cutting the tax burden for everybody, not having targeted uh, giveaways and tax benefits for certain groups of folks somewhere, certain big corporations. Uh, I want to lower the tax burden for, for everybody. We've got a, a, a 
a, a series of proposals that can do that. You know, if I if, if we went and talked to a lot of the most of the folks in this state right now and asked them what tax is affecting them the most, I'm pretty sure personal property tax will come up. So uh, I, we're focused very much on getting rid of personal property tax. I think there's plans that we want to work on the income tax. The, we have more tax credit programs in this state per capita than virtually any other state in the union. And, and, and in spite of all of that special treatment for some, Missouri is not growing. Uh, the population is not growing. We are stagnating and falling behind other states. So I think our continued focus is going to be on lowering the tax burden for everybody. Uh, personal property tax and income taxes in particular. Okay, I'm going to repeat my question. Is there a path forward for child care or is that a dead issue for you? Well, uh, I'll, I'll repeat something that said, I guess uh, there's always a path for everything until we get the last day, but it would be hard to imagine any more tax credits uh, passing in this, uh, this chamber before we're going to get really serious about cutting the overall tax burden. Do you think we should move to like a model like Florida has where they don't have a income tax? Well, it's interesting that you mentioned a state like Florida that is actually growing significantly faster than the state of Missouri. And I think that the lack of the income tax is one of the big reasons why. Uh, Jack, you know what else they don't have down in, in Florida? What? Personal property tax. You know what so, they do have? What do they have? Toll roads. Do you think we should have toll roads? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. No, I, I think that I think government in Missouri has plenty of money. Uh, I think we have plenty of money that we can take care of our roads, we can fund our schools, we can fund all of those local services uh, that we need to do and dramatically reduce uh, the tax burden. And by the way, since you brought up transportation, I'll, I'll give you this nugget of information that if you look at what we're spending per mile of roadway that MoDOT manages in this state right now, adjusted for inflation, we're spending more than twice per mile in this state than when we were back in the year 2000. So I, I, I mean, I appreciate the question about toll roads, but I would reject the idea that we haven't been serious about funding other roads and the infrastructure in the state. Well, do you think we should have toll roads? No, I don't think we should have toll roads. I know there's no reason to take more money from the people of this state. We need to take less money from the people of this state. Um, I noticed that uh, some of the resistance to the education bill this week uh, came from Senator Carter. And I know Senator Moon isn't in the Freedom Caucus, but he's obviously aligned with you guys. And so I was hoping someone named Did, Senator Carter. Okay. So the opposition wasn't necessary to the bill at all. I have a great relationship with Senator Koenig. The, obviously, there is always a pause when you have a 150-page bill dropped on your lap. I don't think the standard should be any different for any of us than we have for you know any other bill that's dropped. So some of that, just sifting through it, trying to decipher what it is, the impact of it. The fiscal note obviously was a question. We didn't have that. Um, so I think that's just doing due diligence. I think we all were trying to come. Senator Schroer also had those questions. So so it's OK to be transparent and to try to go through pieces of legislation to, yeah, I to try to come to a resolution. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think um, what you saw, you saw some of the Freedom Caucus members speak on the bill, and I think that's certainly appropriate. Yeah. I mean, whenever you have a big bill, we want to make sure that it's, you know, it's vetted in that way. And so um, having some of my colleagues back here talk about some of those things on the floor, I had no problem with. I, I think that was certainly appropriate. And when it comes to the fiscal note, there's a lot of stuff in the bill that honestly don't, I don't think will actually might, might not have an actual real cost. Like some of them are subject to appropriations. Um, on the on the ESA portion, if you have a child who goes to a public school and then they are now going to a private school, then the the state won't have to that won't be funded in the formula. So there'll be cost savings due to that. I don't think all of that is actually realized in the fiscal note. Um, and then you have the teacher pay stuff, which also is our we funded it last year. We're funding it again this year. So it's not like a new cost to the state. One of the one of the priorities, obviously, is education freedom. We all that's something that we have in common. So we're going to continue to roll back any any kind of regulations that we feel like is impacting the ability for parents to seek the seek autonomy for their education for their children, wherever that is. So I have two questions for you, Senator Carter. The first one about four day school weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, where do you fall on that? I know you have an interesting rural district. Yes. Um, so four-day school weeks, where, where does your views align? So this is a discussion that we've had um, previously with Senator Beck. I, there is a tug of war, obviously, with those rural school districts. It has primarily um, its roots being in trying to attract good teachers to the rural areas where they're not able to have, they don't have a lot of tax base, right? So, so I think we came up with a good resolution with what's in this package. I'm hopeful, I think our rural school districts will benefit from that. And I just have to ask 
So why didn't you vote on the bill? Why were you absent for the bill? I was preparing for the bill that was coming up right behind it. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Koenig, um, we uh, talked a lot about getting it through the Senate. What about getting it through the House? Are you expecting hurdles? Are you expecting things to get added onto it? What does that talk look like for you? I mean, it's a, it, obviously it's a big package and it, it's, it's uh, you know, obviously, who knows what's going to actually happen. Um, obviously, when we get back from spring break, we'll start working through that process to see what the needs of House members are. How, um, sorry. Um, how, uh, how big of a role um, are these, I think this, there's this new group, Armor Vine, that's basically raising concerns about school choice from the, the conservative viewpoint, and they're saying, they're, I think they're worried about more government involvement in these religious schools. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the way we structured the ESA program, there's no intrusion into the private school. We've ca created several degrees of separation between the private school and government. Um, so obviously it's a tax credit scholarship program, so it's funded through donations. Uh, you know, the government involvement really comes into play between government and the EAOs, and then the EAOs hand out those scholarships to the parents, and the parents go where they want. So um, the way it's structured is I was very diligent to make sure there were several degrees of separation between the private school and government so that because I do not want government intrusion into those private schools. I have a question for Senator Eichel. Um, Senator Eichel, oh. um, yes, you, you are um, not shy about um, um, using the filibuster and, and speaking about using the filibuster to achieve your goals. Mm -hmm. um, in the event, um, it doesn't seem likely right now, but in the event that um, universal pre-K made it to the floor, um, how um, would you be open to using a filibuster to oppose that? Well, it, it's a, in a speculative question like that, yeah. where we don't know exactly what bill you'd be talking about in that, in that case. Uh, it's very difficult to give an answer to that question. Uh, I would say you're right. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly not shy. Uh, but at the same time, I would say that we have a responsibility to vet any legislation that comes to the floor. And I, and I think that there's, uh, there's a miscommunication sometimes that every time we stand up and maybe ask a question or two, there's a concern that we're filibustering. That's not necessarily the case. But whatever bill it was, uh, whether it had to do with pre-K or not, I think that we would, uh, uh, we would be happy to lead the way in vetting that legislation when it came to the floor. And if it has things that we opposed, uh, then you know, maybe it'll take a little bit longer. Okay, and then maybe to anyone yeah, in the, so I know I, I personally have a fundamental problem with the expansion of pre -K, like a universal pre-K. I'm definitely against that. I think children should be, um, if at all possible, the parents should be responsible for those children, and it shouldn't be necessarily government responsible for that task. Well, you know, we continue to, to create these programs. We continue to expand government over and over and over and over, creating a, a tax burden that is so onerous and burdensome on these families that actually force them out of uh, the homes, rearing their children. It forces them to have to get these jobs. So we've got to look at, at reducing the, the tax burden and the capability for people to be able to care for their own children if they want to. Uh, we've, our, our, the inflation has been so extreme, it's eight to $10,000 per family. I mean, it's, it's unsustainable, so, but we continue to go to government as though it's the answer when it's not. Uh, and actually, like childcare, that the government has created that problem where we've, we've enacted regulations and, and onerous rules on, on childcare facilities that it's not worth it. And, and the small you know, moms and grandmas that wanted to, to do something to help out their community, they, they're not going to put up with those regulations or licensure and all those sorts of things. So we've ran them out of business. Now, all of a sudden, it's almighty government coming with the solution to that. And that's the ideological difference. We need to re, you know, deregulate and, and make sure that that burden is, is low to where people can care for their own families and not have government institutions rearing their children. So uh, I, one more question and we're done. I just want to talk about the FRA if possible. I think we talked about it a few weeks ago, but just to see if there's any different, we have the Planned Parenthood bill coming over from the House. Does that bill need to be passed on the Senate floor before the FRA gets brought up? What, where does the Freedom Caucus get? Well, first and foremost, we, we act as though it's like 911 has to be done tomorrow. I mean, it does not have to be renewed till, till the end of September. Uh, but you know, the, the Hippocratic Oath, the, the pillar of health care is to do no harm. Abortion is harm uh, to the little child that is, is murdered within the womb. And, and we have a, 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 
a charge by the people who elected us to protect that life at all costs and not fund uh, facilities that, that enable that, as we've seen uh, through Project Veritas vid videos. So if we're able to defund you know, those that are doing harm and, and be able to, to help fund those that aren't, uh, we're, we're willing to, and able to, to make that happen. But until that happens, uh, it's gonna be a, an, an issue with this, this Freedom Caucus. So thank you.